Subaru's throat had frozen shut at the sight of his own face reflected in the mirror. Natsuki Subaru is now only 10 years old physically, and upon this revelation his hand begins to tremble. He rushes to the bedroom door hearing a commotion outside, and it was only natural to think he was under attack, and he wants to inform everyone until... Medium points out that Subaru has gotten smaller too, and she now stands at around 12 to 13 years old. Luis tackles Subaru to the ground, and Medium is now too small to get her off, but Tarita, who had not been shrunken, saves him. Abel also remains the same, that just leaves Al who had indeed reverted to being around 10. Due to his helmet no longer fitting, he now wears ill-fitting cloth around his face. His arm also hasn't grown back, meaning it's not directly de-aging, just a shrinking of their body of sorts. He can no longer wield his blade at all, and Medium can barely cling onto one of her two twin swords. Teresa had become their only legitimate fighter, and Abel is a bit surprised. He expected Subaru to be more distraught about this, and he then informs the party that Obart is responsible. He is unaware of how he fights. All he knows is that he is the head of the shinobi. Subaru goes, oh, ninjas, a word that Abel doesn't understand, but Al likens them to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. They think back to the hit that they took before escaping the castle, and Al himself says that he had a few run-ins with Olbar before leaving. Subaru was proud of himself for having faced a variety of experiences in this world so far. Although death was the most extreme, it was quite possible to say that the dense experiences of the past year and a half were incomparably richer in color, taste, and density than that of an ordinary person. Upon the thought of an ordinary person, his mind flashes to the victims of lust in Pristella. This is what it feels like to be one. The sounds he heard, the people still waiting to be saved, haunted his mind. Abel is uncertain if this technique can be undone, but it's reasonable to assume that a way exists. Suddenly, a knock at the front door is heard. Tanza has returned, and she pauses upon seeing none of the messengers from yesterday. She tells them that Yorna had read the letter, and invites everyone to the Crimson Lapis Castle. But she does not want just Abel, but all of the messengers. This poses some obvious issues so Subaru calls a strategy meeting. They have three hours to decide upon a plan, and they discuss the logistics now that they are children, and oh, Olbar is here too. Everyone in the room goes rigid. His aura overpowers whatever atmosphere was in the room before. Tarita quickly aims her bow at him, but he tells her that that isn't a good idea. It's so lonely these days, young people just don't want to listen to an old man's chatter. He reveals that he got in when they opened the door for Tanza, and Subaru asks what he's doing here. He reveals with zero hesitation that he indeed turned them into children. This is how he can squeeze information out of targets without killing them. Abel demands once more what Olbar is doing here, and Subaru wonders how Olbar can't recognize the Emperor in front of him. He came to listen to what they have to say. A lot of people fail to challenge the Emperor, so why are they different? He will make a decision after hearing what they have to say, and he will do something to ensure that they cannot lie. In silence, Subaru glances at Abel's profile. His true identity was the absolute most important piece of information in order to conquer Olbart. Abel meets the boy's gaze. Olbart tells him that someone's face says more than you'd expect. Their gazes, the way their faces tense up, the way their muscles contract just a little. Time was ticking and Subaru saw this as an opportunity, calling to Abel and telling Olbart that this is the Emperor, Vincent Valakia. Abel goes along with Subaru's plan, taking his mask off. Obart is very confused. It's not like Vincent to let this unfold. Obart then tells them that he has made a decision. Being an old man without much time to live, he has always wanted to try and kill the Emperor. That very moment, Tarita, Al, and Medium all moved to frustrate Obart's purpose, overriding the no-fighting rule given up by Yorna and Tanza. Obart singles out Al. He couldn't understand what trick he was using earlier, but it stopped working when he turned little. He gouges out the necks of Medium and Al. Subaru looks over to Tarita, who had already been killed by a shuriken. His thoughts turned white. No, a bright red. Whether it was anger or Al's blood, he couldn't tell. He stands up to shield Abel from Olbart's attack, but it isn't long before his head also goes flying. I have a lot to say about Al's authority not working, but there is a better time to say it, so we'll put a pin in that for now. Subaru's skin begins to ache. The air he had taken in froze over within his lungs, as if a heavy, sharp object had been buried in his chest. As the situation in the room with Olbart flashes through his mind, a voice chimes in. Can you do it? While in those thoughts wishful of a breakthrough, a cold voice wedged itself in. Born of impatience and frustration, it was none other than the feeble voice of Subaru himself. He wiped out all of your friends just a moment ago, ending in that mess. The more he tried to think, the more the voice whispered to him. Devoid of mercy. His failure, his blunder, his irreparable mistake. It was irreversible. The only thing granted by return by death was atonement, which he could not atone for. Subaru slaps his cheeks to break the cycle, and Olbart reiterates him keeping them alive for information. But even if he tried to kill them, Al would have blocked all of his attempts at doing so. Al says he doesn't know what he means, but Olbar laughs in his face. If he could, he'd ask how he does it in detail. Images of Todd flash through Subaru's head. Prior, returned by death brought him back into a cage with a bloodthirsty beast, and yet again, it had happened. It even makes Subaru ponder if his authority had been compromised in some manner, as Abel asks Olbart of his technique. Subaru glances at Abel, but when he doesn't look back, he gets it. He would act to give Subaru the time required to figure something out. Abel, poking for Olbart's true aims, deduces that surely he must be aiming for a seat of the first. In actual fact, Subaru knew Abel's point was incorrect, but what Abel had correctly pointed out was his thirst. 
Abel was arrogant, with no consideration for others. Nevertheless, he was the Emperor, an existence upon the Imperial throne. The preservation of his own life held precedent. He possesses the self-awareness to know that with his loss, the Empire would become greatly unstable. That was the inevitable awareness that was possessed by the Valachian Emperor. And on the other hand, that would be a sense of responsibility held by everyone, even if not as strong as his. This was that which Albart did not have. He did not mind dying if so fulfilled his ambition. Subaru pipes up, you're not after the seed of the first, you're after the Emperor. Albart tries to laugh off his words, and even Al calls it a leap. Subaru reiterates their goal is to overthrow Vincent Valachia, so their goals align. Albart, without denying it, simply tells Subaru to shut up. Abel then says he will give him the opportunity to kill the Emperor. The reason he has not yet actualized it is due to the flames of the Yang Sword. Albart gently places his teacup on the desk, telling them it's too early to talk about his motives. But he has a lot of things on his mind, so why not play a game? With a toothy grin at Subaru, asking what he's talking about, Obart reveals the game, a game of tag. Obart will run, and the others must catch him. If you find him thrice, you win. There were three major agreements made. One, do not harm each other. Two, hide within the city. And three, clarify the conditions of victory. Subaru says that if they win, he'll have him put them back to normal. If Obart wins, then they'll just have to wait ten years to regrow. Obart's first hint for hiding is, quote, behind the eyelids. Al and Medium with their swords and Subaru with his whip are prepared to head out. They slam the door with a loud bang, stepping out of the inn with great vigor, before immediately spinning around and returning to their room. Found you, Subaru exclaims, and indeed, Olbar begins to cackle. He had snuck into the room when the door was opened. The expression behind the eyelids made this the first place he thought of. A distant, nostalgic memory came to Subaru's mind. His first time meeting Beatrice. All of it was because of Bayako's... For some reason, when he tries to picture her, the thought is simply bleached white. Moving on, Olbar gives them their second hint an abyss with a great view. Subaru had no ideas this time, and he tells the party that they can't rely on him this time. Al says it isn't unreasonable for you not to get it, after all, I'm here with you. And he asks if he's implying that if he gets dumber when Al is around, but he denies. It's too hard to explain, he says. Abel says they will go to a tavern, someplace populated, and as soon as Subaru heads out of the inn, a scarlet light scattered at the edge of his field of vision. Subaru blinks, and Olbart stands before them. Oh. Found you, he says, and Albart is confused. Oh, do you feel like you're playing the game? That is when he realized he had no choice but to accept that he had returned by death, in contradiction to the rule that should have prevented that. He hears behind the eyelids again as the flow of events continues as normal. Al notes the paleness of Subaru's face, telling him he needs to get a grip. His and Medium's abilities were halved because of infantilization, but his intellect should still remain. Subaru informs him that another problem has turned up besides the hide-and-seek game. His heart begins to race. Sweat pouring down his forehead, and Medium asks if he's okay, and if he's worried about going outside. She pulls him into an embrace, stroking his back, saying, Flop would do this for her when she was scared too. He's afraid of the outside, there is something bad out there. Someone is trying to kill them, and if we go outside, we die. The world stood still. The clear, audible pulse of Medium faded into eternity, and her face and breathing, which were right in front of him, went out of reach. Color was lost, sound was lost, the flow of time was lost. The freedom to move was lost. Why was he violating this taboo of return by death? Why did he forget? His heart was gripped, and a tremendous pain tore Subaru's motionless body to shreds. Time flows again, but his soul feels violated. Al says he can't stay small, and they have to win this game. And Subaru tells him that they won't forfeit the game, and they have to believe him no matter how strange he sounds. Tarita backs up Subaru's claims, saying they are in a trap, so it's not so bad to have your guard raised. Abel is not impressed with Subaru's claims, but Al tells him that this isn't the first time he said something outrageous, and if you disrespect him, then you're going to ruin his mood too. Even though his voice was that of a boy's, the change in Al's tone was enough to change the mood. Subaru begs him to please stop fighting. He loses, he gives up. They had already been warned, and that was the most he could ask for. We see the same events play out after finding Olbart in the bedroom, and Subaru wants to put in place Abel's plan from the previous loop of going to a tavern. Al is again impressed with him finding him, and Subaru likens it to... who? Who is it that stands out in Subaru's memory? Al says it probably wasn't the half-elf, so Beatrice, Subaru shouts. Suddenly, Teresa calls out that they are surrounded already, by about a hundred enemies. Despite this harsh circumstance, Abel's gaze does not leave Subaru. He has problems beyond being surrounded, he says. Medium asks if he's alright, and he responds that his memory is getting... hazy. He's having trouble remembering things he should remember. Abel demands he specify his condition exactly. Has he forgotten, or is it taking a long time to remember? Subaru shouts that he hasn't forgotten. Abel ignores him, turning to Tarita and asking to the status of the enemy. She replies that they are concealing their breathing, so Abel bends down, close to Subaru. What do we do for those outside to attack us? Subaru tenses up. He doesn't understand the question. He demands, repeating his question, trampling all over Subaru's hesitation and confusion. Subaru cries out that as soon as they go outside, he gets attacked. His heart skips a beat, fearing the backlash from Satella, but it doesn't come. Luis rushes to Subaru, throwing Abel's arm off his shoulder. Al looks onto the fighting duo, describing it as an adult talking down to a child. Abel then announces that their enemy is here. It is Chaos Flame itself. The people that reside in this city. 
In the missive, Abel had said that he would reward Yorna with what she desires. Simultaneously, Al and Medium shout out to be her wife. Abel calls for Tarita to draw their attention, and while she captures their focus, they will sneak out. The plans and conversation move at such a pace that Subaru's now childlike brain can't keep up. The moment Tarita stepped outside, hostility swelled quickly. Twenty of the 100 enemies were targeting her, as she let loose three arrows at the same time, each pointed at a different prey. Three men were hit and instantly downed. Hunting is comfortable, she thinks. It suited her, because she was not required to talk to anybody. With a roar, several shadows rush into the alley. She dispatches not just the entire alleyway, but even a large oxman with ease. Following Eowulf's advice, she is aiming for nothing but vitals. Something is odd, however. Despite aiming for vitals and killing hundreds of beasts in her days, these people won't die. In those eyes that gazed at her, a change occurred. The oxman got back up, and a scarlet flame was covering his right eye. Not just him, but everyone around her. Flames similar to those burned away and healed the wounds of the Oxman. As they run, Subaru is amazed by Tarita's skill. He could, however, not shake off the strangeness of the attackers. Abel remarks that this entire city is covered by the soul marriage technique, a supposedly lost secret arts spoken of in ancient literature. By sharing a part of one's soul with others, value is added. Souls united via soul marriage technique share a fraction of their power, and in the city, there is merely a single wielder of it. Everyone in this city shares the power of Yorna Meshigure. Therefore, this city is a land that shall not fall easily, no matter how many armies you dispatch. Okay. First things first, soul marriage technique is fucking awesome, and the best part is, is that it gets better later on. What is more important to discuss about this phase is Kid Subaru. In phase 2, he wears the getup of Natsumi Schwartz to put on fake confidence, and throughout phase 3, struggles with his masculinity. This is something I go over extensively in my phase 3 video, so check it out if you haven't somehow. What happens now is he shoulders what he perceives as the loss of the bloodless siege of Goral. He takes everyone's feelings, including Rem's inferiority, and places it on his shoulders. All he could do now is face Abel's words. That his idea was foolish, naive, immature, and henceforth, he becomes a literal child. He feels the shame of an adult talking down to a child after feeling he was proven wrong. Now being unable to coherently put his ideas together, the overpowering aura of Abel's ideals causes Subaru to shiver and tear up. Losing his Natsumi identity and reverting to a child has Subaru lose all of his confidence he had in his ideals. The purposes of Arc 7 and Kid Subaru at large are very clear. This is a test of his newfound, alleged confidence. A test of his never accepting sacrifice, it is the same burden that Roswell told him he would have to carry in Arc 4, and we now see the damage it has done to him. My next question is, why is Subaru forgetting, and why wasn't it immediate? Al is the one that has to jog Subaru's memory about Bayako, as if his memories are still intact, and Medium seems relatively put together. Considering even Subaru considers the possibility that something is wrong with her turn by death, I wonder if there is some interesting interaction with the authority in Olbart's technique. Speaking of authorities, what the fuck happened to Al? His authority, for some reason, no longer works, but why would infantilization disable his domain authority, while keeping Return by Death intact? My theory at this point is that it has something to do with Satella's love. Subaru, having reverted to a child, has lost some of Satella's love, hence why RBD is seemingly on the fritz. However, Al has reverted even further. Instead of losing 8 years, Al has rewound back 30 plus years, and based on his behavior in this arc later on, is a completely separate person than the one Satella might have chosen when he was first isekai'd and bestowed with the authority. Or however the hell that works. A bigger question is, how the hell does Olbart know about his looping? Not only does he somehow know about Al's looping, but he knew that he no longer had the capability to do so. I know this dude is an old shinobi, so he's pretty knowledgeable, but what else does he know? Apparently, not how Subaru has a trick up his sleeve as well. And finally, Subaru was acting super suspicious in this loop, and I feel Abel picked up on that. He somehow knew about the hundreds of people surrounding them and stated explicitly that if he were to go outside, he would die. How did he know that? Abel's probably wondering. The viewer is likely wondering why did the condition of the contract with Satella not activate? So many mysteries, so few answers. Abel, Subaru, Al, and Medium find a place that they can stop running, as Abel continues on about soul marriage. It involves ceding a portion of one's soul to another, and by soul, he means owed. It connects your very essence, thus those connected can draw power from one another. Forming what amounts to contracts with so many people was extremely dangerous. It was essentially tearing apart the very foundation of one's being and handing it over indiscriminately. Al ponders if Yorna had sent the attackers, and if she knows what's going on, but Subaru chimes in. Even though he and Bayako were connected, he has no idea what she's doing right now. Subaru thinks of a path forward, and his mind wanders to Tarita, and suddenly, he blinks as he feels something strange. He had to find out what his brain had caught onto just now. Ignoring Medium's call with his impatience, the fierce warrior of the people Tarita fights grips his heart. Al gets more and more frustrated, his voice growing louder, and he begins to kick the walls around him, asking what Abel plans on doing. He replies that they must confirm soul marriage, so they must grab a random off the street and harm them. If they remain wounded or die, they are outside the influence. It was so outlandish that Subaru's brain went numb. He tries to interject, but Abel cuts him off before he could speak. If you reject it, then what? His face goes red, and he begins to stammer. You don't have to hurt anyone, he yells out. If he has a plan, he will listen, but considering his current state, Abel is not expecting one. He says that Subaru is particularly afraid of sacrifices. 
Why is that a problem, though? It's not a problem, it is merely a fact, he says. If you are to obtain what you desire, you shall require either ingenuity or strength. If you lack those, you must compromise by cutting back on the desired results, such as what occurred with the process and the results brought about by the blood the siege you spoke of. If you want neither deaths nor wounded, you must possess the ability to bring about that result. The one thing that can flash through Subaru's mind is, I don't understand. I don't understand, I don't understand. He was trying his utmost to think, but nothing came. If that's how it is, it'd be better if only he got hurt, he proclaims. He knew he wasn't strong enough. That was a problem for Subaru the entire time. Tears began to well up in his eyes as he turns and runs from the party. Al and Medium call out to him as he runs straight into the street. He didn't want anyone to be hurt. He didn't want anyone to die. But he lacked both the ability and the smarts necessary for that. If something was to be traded to make up for what was missing, it was Subaru himself. He shouts at the top of his lungs, Come on, I'm here. As everyone turns to look at him, his heart freezes. The eyes of people around him looking at a child doing something stupid made him feel shame and fear. A short boy with curly hair grabs hold of him, who apologizes to Subaru. The next moment, Subaru is flung away. Overwhelmed by spinning vision, his body reached the maximum height, as he began to fall headfirst to the ground. Death seemed to be close at hand again. Shortly after, he hears the screams of Alan Medium, who catch him before certain death. He's alive, but Al and Medium are hurt. The boy then returns, saying that he hoped that would be the end of it. It's necessary because they can't lose Yorna. Just like the ones in the alley, Subaru only notices one thing about this boy. The pained look in their faces. As he approaches to kill Subaru, Luis intervenes to take the hit. And this event is the perfect symbol of what I was talking about earlier, how Subaru feels he can no longer justify his own ideology, and that defeat has made him regress to his older, toxic ways of thinking. If he can't think to save everyone, he will put the only thing of value on the line, his own life. We even see a wonderfully consistent callback to parent and child, as the harsh stares of Chaos Flame suddenly call back to him acting out for attention in his actual childhood, causing his throat to lock up. And now Subaru sees the consequences of thinking only his life can be given. He sees how unfair it is, as Al, Medium, and Luis pay for his recklessness, because his actions don't affect only himself, but the people around him. Luis gets flung backwards by the hit, and the sheep boy apologizes to Subaru again, but Medium kicks him off and yells at him to stand to take care of Luis. He dashes to her, attempting to pick up the rubble that had collapsed in her body. Tears well up in his eyes, as he is too weak to lift it up. A frail groan resounded from under it, and, struck with terror, his limbs turned cold. He could not even comfort her by doing his best to remove it. He calls her name over and over, his voice quivering. Ever since he was hurled from the tower along with Rem, he had always placed Luis beside him. He had always been vigilant towards her, yet never even once had Luis done anything harmful towards Subaru. Why did he fear Luis so much? He couldn't remember very well what Luis had done to him. He was unable to open the drawer of memories, however, there was one thing clear to him. Without needing to open that drawer, she shed blood protecting him. He squeezes his little body into the gap under the rubble to be with her, begging her not to die. A weak voice escapes her, as the young girl's pupils regain faint strength. Medium was on the back foot down the street. The sheep boy is sturdy and powerful, yet he has bad technique. She yells out to Al for help, but he does not respond. It wasn't because he was missing or unconscious, but he had halted his feet and knelt down, crestfallen. He stares at his right hand, as if he had let go of, or lost what he was supposed to have kept within reach. In every battle, Medium had flopped to encourage her to do her best. Everyone here is preoccupied, however. The tide creeps in even further as reinforcements arrive. A hand reaches out to grab Al, until, Will you not yet move, fool? Al gets kicked, toppling over sideways, narrowly avoiding the attack. Abel has entered the street scuffle, calling to Medium, and as she prepares herself for the reprimand that would surely follow, he instead says, Make a proper effort. Her eyes dilate to the voice that quaked her eardrums, as she lashes out at her surrounding opponents. They come in from behind, grabbing her hair, and she yells out to Abel to take Al and run. Abel is surrounded by enemies. Pointing out in front of him is an Oxman, and the boy earlier is a sheep. The ones targeting them are horned races. He meets the Oxman's gaze, telling him that he can try it. In response, he widens his eyes, glaring back at Abel, as he adds, You can try whether you can kill me. The answer to whether it is easy or not lies ahead of action. Thus, you can try. If you possess the caliber, flames shall extol you. However, if you lack that caliber, flames shall scorch even your soul. Now what will you act upon? You can try, whether you can surpass the flames named Judgment. The Oxman is covered in copious sweat, tension straining his entire body. From the point of having seen Abel's eyes, they had been taken off the stage. In the next instant, Subaru and Luis's forms vanish from underneath the tent. Luis shoots directly below the Oxman's chin, blowing him straight into the air as she proceeds to go on a full assault, taking down the reinforcements that arrived. Subaru can do nothing but raise his arm with a trembling voice, cowered in terror towards the nightmarish spectacle transpiring before his eyes. He thinks of that power, that power that must not be, that authority that must perish. Abel reckoned she was no mere girl. He understands now. If Subaru was asked why he had her with him, he would fail to answer. Luis by herself had trounced more than ten enemies. Abel looks toward the fallen boy, saying his and the clown's true natures have been exposed. Subaru then rushes over to Al, asking if he's alright, but he declines. He's not wounded, though. He calls himself useless. 
he is useless. His present self is going to die. Abel approaches the sheep boy on the ground. The mediator of the horned races who devised this affair. That girl who named herself Tanza. Where is she hiding, he asks. Luis leaps onto Subaru and he was not mistaken. That power was the same thing he had seen in the Tower of the Sand. She had used a gluttony's authority. The sheep boy yells out that they have done something to Tanza, and he tries to choke Abel, but Luis then saves him. Abel stands up without regard to that exchange or attempt on his life, saying they need to find Olbart immediately. Horned races have a history of persecution due to their similarities with witch beasts, which is an amazing detail by Tape that I never even considered. Those horned races found peace here, and Yorna's existence is indispensable for maintaining that. Their presence is an intolerable enemy that shall rock the very ground on which the persecuted stand, as they seek to support Yorna for a full-scale rebellion. Subaru thinks back to their pained expressions, they felt guilty for driving the party out, but feared that they were here to take their safe place away. If Tanza had organized an attack on the inn, where has she gone now? The only possible conspirator for Tanza was Olbart. As for your case, Abel says, turning to Subaru, you have lost your ability to comprehend and your creativity. Olbart's technique must be affecting your very ode. He then turns to Luis, as Medium thanks her for saving her and goes to pat her head, but Subaru grabs the young girl's wrist, saying she shouldn't get close. Al, in a low voice, asks for Subaru to tell them what's up. What secret are you keeping about this girl? Subaru's young, deficient brain could not make up a lie that sounded plausible. That is why he told them that Luis Arneb is one of the Sin Archbishops of Gluttony. Medium lets out a shocked whimper. Subaru had optimistically thought that the O'Connell siblings would take it in stride and laugh it off. There was an unmistakable, certain fear that flashed across Medium's eyes. Al tells him, that isn't funny. It's not a joke, though, Subaru cries out. Then it's even less funny. He pulls out the oversized sword on his back, telling Subaru he can't be right in his head. Has he forgotten what happened in Pristella? A hilariously hypocritical thing to hear from Al, considering his possible involvement with Regulus or other Sin Archbishops. Of course, Subaru doesn't know that, and can only think that Al is right. He should not have let Luis run amok. He should have tied her up and held her captive, but he didn't. He turns to Abel, his last bastion. Medium was frightened, Al was enraged, and Abel says that he is unsure how it works in other nations, but in the Empire, those who serve the witch for any reason whatsoever are executed. Subaru shuts his eyes tight, calling out Luis's name, as she grabs his waist and leaps high into the air. He blamed himself. He blamed his heart for not just handing over Luis. He's an idiot. No, he's definitely an idiot. It was idiotic to leave Medium and Al behind, and run away with Luis. If he makes a decision now, he might regret it. This is not a choice a child should make. He is certain the original him would make the right decision, so he must dispel this infantilization as soon as possible, and return to the young man known as Subaru Natsuki. Al's heart boils with fury, as Abel says he has no intention of reuniting with them right now. He looks up where they disappeared and only mutters a single word. Fool. Enemies catch up to Subaru and Luis, but they are quickly defeated by gluttony. The problem was, when they go down, she does not stop. Subaru repeatedly must pull her off the enemy, telling her they are desperate. They don't want their place in the world to be destroyed. As they flee, someone calls them. A young man with a thin face was beckoning Subaru and Luis, who had no horns. He points out a cart for them to hide under. They have no time. The alignment of the stars changes every moment. It's up to them to shun it or to accept it. After the horde of Oxmen pass, Subaru asks the man why he helped them. The man is Ubilk, the man who attempted to overthrow Vincent Velaki in EX5, and now the current stargazer for the Empire. Subaru considers him a suspicious adult, and wants to leave in a hurry, but Ubilk asks them to wait a minute. Let us help one another. Mutual aid is wonderful. He used his slender legs to jog around Subaru, cutting him off in the alleyway. Luis tightens her grip on Subaru's hand, and he can only ask what he wants help with. The man responds that it was a slip of the tongue, not a request for help. The mood is cold. Do you hate me? He bends down, his face being pushed away by Luis, and Subaru tells him that you don't want to make Luis angry. And Ubilk's response is, so that is her name, isn't it? He wasn't planning on walking around today, but something compelled him to wander around aimlessly and wait next to this cart. Are you amazed by me, he asks? Subaru tells him that he never wants to see him again. His sharpness reminds Ubilk of an old friend of his. He is in the business of giving small consultations. Would you like one, he asks? He wants to fulfill his assigned role, the chance for them to consult him. The stars have aligned. Funnily enough, this is the same language used when Al was given the chance to reset in one of his side stories. He asks for Subaru's hand, and he reluctantly gives it up. Within an instant, Ubilk is done. The answers that Subaru seeks are within him. Maybe it's the problem in front of you. You were both being chased, right? What do you think about that? An abyss with a great view, he thinks. A eureka moment for Subaru. The consultation worked. He thanks Ubilk as he immediately sprints off, and he closes one eye at the fleeing Subaru. He is unsure what the stars desire, even though that is what comes with the duty of a stargazer. My current knowledge of stargazers is pretty much a compilation of all of my previous thoughts after learning about the observers. The stars are the observers, who have ascribed a direction they want the world to go in. I believe the way they could do this, as they are stars, is through light and gravity. By peering through light, we observe time. 
When you look up at a night sky, what you are seeing is the light from stars looking back at you. But it's not the stars as they are, but as they were, as light can only travel at a fixed speed. The observers cast a light and the stargazers peer back at them to interpret that very message and guide the world towards that direction. You can argue that the three heroes were possibly tools of the observers, as someone had set up something that altered space-time around the Pleiades watchtower, and Volcanica also used a method of space-time manipulation once Atella appeared. This would also include Ode Laguna, a tool for recycling everything including mana, and we now know what Volcanica is made of. This is when the arrogance of the Valakian family comes into play. As the lore of the nation heavily plays into this idea of ascribed fate or breaking the stage, only the Valakian royal family would be egotistical enough to challenge light itself, hence why they are protected by the very notion, utilizing the Yang Sword and being protected by its brilliant radiance. The only way to fight light is with light itself, and it doesn't help that Ubilk's only connection to where Cass is exclusively through cast members with star-related names, minus Vincent, Aldebron, Subaru, and the Pleiades, and of course, Luis Arneb. To follow this star-talking trend, Subaru and Luis head to a place close to the sky. A hole with a great view. An abyss was not just a hole, but a deep hole one could fall forever and ever. When Subaru was thrown into the sky a couple of hours ago, he looked up towards the sky and noticed it was as if he was falling towards it. The Crimson Lapis Castle, the tallest building in the Demon City. Olbart was likely hiding at the very top. Utilizing Luis's teleportation ability, the two sneak into the castle, but they take their time as warping too much too quickly makes Subaru feel ill. Inside the castle, they are spotted by the one person they had hoped to not run into, Yorna Mishigure. She asks what brings them here. Are you perhaps here for Tanza? The fear stabs his heart, but when he looks at Luis's reassuring eyes, looking back at him, he regains some confidence and he turns to ask where Tons is. She says the dear girl is out on an errand. She will not be back for some time. The woman kindly tells the children that they can wait for Tons' return in her room. She notes that she does not recognize the children, and they have yet to receive her love letter. Subaru says they are with a scary grown-up, and it wasn't entirely wrong as he thinks back to Abel. Yorna points out his pained expression, and he's glad that she's worried for him. But the man is someone who would see reason once spoken with. She says there are many people in this world who have trouble finding reason. A mixture of things went through Subaru's head feeling bad for stopping her, worried that she might get angry if he said what he wanted to say, but he stops, calling out to her. He was sure people of high status would be scary, as she tilted her head at that message. As they are not demi-humans, she asks what this city looks like to them, and he says it's amazing. A busy city with so many types of people, she forms a faint smile. And this city is full of people who have a hard time in other places, those that become insignificant outside the city, children with nowhere else to go. Children that would go unnoticed even if they raised their voices. If we don't lend an ear to the children who have reached the last place they can go to, then who will? He thinks back to Taz's impression of Yorna last phase, and she was completely right. Chaos Flame is what Yorna cherished from within her heart. People of high status wish to be feared, she tells him. She was in a good mood today. There are signs that she might get what she wanted for a long time. Subaru did not have the brains to think about the right answer, so we asked her a question. And we then cut to the roof of the castle as Olbart admires the view from above, before Subaru, Luis, and Yorna find him up there. Subaru calls Olbart a real jerk, and he replies asking if he's hungry before taking out a small round object, a ration ball, and scarfing it down. He dreamed of retiring and not eating this anymore, yet here he is. Yorna asks if he recalls that this is her castle. She is very clearly pissed off, concealing half of her face with her kimono sleeve. He asks why she's with them, and she tells them that she has no taste for teasing children or torturing them. If she hears that he has misled these children and deceived her attendant, as the mistress of the city, she will do what she must. Subaru apologizes. He had to tell on him. He had them attacked, too. Olbart compliments his underhandedness, asking him if he's a Valakian royal, and Yorna interrupts this line of thought, asking where Tanza is. Subaru begins to bite his lip, as he feels the pressure of two divine generals feuding. Yorna holds up two fingers, saying she has two requests for the vicious old man. First, return Tanza to her. Second, stop playing the game with these children. She will not allow her messengers to be toyed with. Whose town do you believe this is, Olbart? Do you think I'm a woman so open-minded that I laugh and pardon it? The air feels like it's boiling around Subaru. He had seen many angry people with their lives on the line. Their emotions would flare up. That much would be visible by just being at their side. He yells out to Olbart, Why don't we call it even? They both did something bad, they cancel out. Olbart, however, does not like the idea of leaving a game half-finished, crushing the gourd of alcohol in his hand. Yorna calls him an old man who won't take the hand offered by a child, as her legs swing down as she rushes towards him, splitting the Crimson Lapis castle in two. She kicks the tower, having it bend and shatter. A single strike from Yorna's heel had literally caused the keep to collapse. Subaru screams, why is this happening, as tears stream down his face. Directly above her, blending in with the billowing smoke and debris, was Olbart's figure. She puts her Kisaru in her mouth, exhaling a plume of purple smoke, into which Olbart kicked the sky and dove with the speed of an arrow. His kick diffused the smoke with the impact of two blows, and when it cleared, it no longer served as armor. He remarks he is unfamiliar with that technique, and she apologizes. It is a technique that cannot be imitated by a shinobi who cannot love anyone. He tries to break her kisaru with a kunai, but his blade shatters in his hand, 
and Subaru ponders what he can do here. There is nothing he can do. He didn't want a war in this city. Obart manages to knock Yorna into the air, spelling certain death as Shuriken barrel towards her until they stop in their tracks. As the roof tiles fly directly into the air, she moves her arms and the tiles form a staircase, making her way back down to the castle tower. She claps her hands as the half-demolished castle keep was restored before Subaru's eyes. She wasn't just using soul marriage on the town, but the castle itself. Yorna Mishigure was a being literally out of this world. Her ode was being instilled into even inorganic substances, and the only thing that Subaru could think is how bad this must be for her body. She collides with Olbart, consecutive shockwaves chase after him as he spins backwards hopping away. He turns his gaze onto the two children as Yorna yells out to him, charging towards him and unleashing a flurry of blows, but he only grins. It was for that reason alone that she had not reached his excellency even once. He pulls out his ration balls, but they contain chunks of fire magic stones throwing them with no particular aim, risking the lives of the innocent in the demon city. Yorna grabs hold of her kisaru. The smoke overflowing from the tip of the pipe traced the same arc as the swing of her arm, flashing a slash across the sky of chaos flame. The smoke slashes through every bomb caught about, explosions flying all around Subaru and dyeing his vision red. Luis shakes him, her mouth quivering in terror. Seeing that before his eyes, he assures her that he is fine, and at the edge of his vision, Olbart is behind Yorna. His hand about to pierce her chest, Subaru yells at Luis to intervene, and within the next second, the teleport happens, and fluid runs down his face without warning. He calls to Luis, but Olbart points out that there is nothing left above her neck. Yorna shouts in a fiery rage as Luis's figure had turned red. Whether it was because of the explosion or her body being doused in blood, he could not tell. She had acted as she was told by Subaru, and as a result, she died. Subaru had let her die. Yorna clasps both of his cheeks, telling him to look at her. He could not tell it was her at first, because the expression on her face was one of grief. Right now, her eyes were shaking as she looked at him. Looking at himself in the reflection of her eye, his left eyeball had burst into bright red, and his right one had popped out of its socket, held by a string. Yorna moves her lips to his and tells him to love her right now. To love, and to do it at this moment, was awfully absurd. He slowly collapses as his vision flickers. He tells her that he has a girl he likes, so he cannot love her. Her face tenses up in a grave pain. Within a second, it was as if he was teleported again, but Luis was still dead. He can see Yorna on her knees and Olbart standing before her. Next to her was the body of Luis, but there was another form standing there. It was the body of young Subaru, a child missing his head. He was dragged into a dark space, an empty space with no hands or feet. It was incomprehensible. Neither sky nor ground existed. An echo of weeping, of someone's crying voice. One that made his non-existent heart beat. I love you, he hears. Like an appeal of love, a request of love, a plea for love, a deferment of love. The voice had requested for love over and over. Crammed among the entirety of those emotions, in the entirety of that whirling love was only sadness. Unceasingly, that was sobbing. The sobbing made him yearn for death just because he was listening to it. Love was sadness. Love was made of sadness. Love was made of sadness. While sobbing, while carrying out love on love, while saddened by sadness, they united at the terminus. Where are you? He resets as Yorna and Olbart clash, right as the bomb goes off in his face. His whole body bathed by the same shock that had bathed it mere moments ago. Subaru's field of vision was dyed bright red again. Covering his face with both hands, he screamed as he was struck by both pain and understanding. His name was being called, but he didn't understand. His ears were burning and his own voice was too loud. The pain, the gushing blood, he could hear it. He did not understand whether it was the blood flowing inside or outside his body. It hurt. It just hurt. Somebody help. Olbart yells out, Is that a bad idea? Pain swirling around in Subaru's head, his red vision glazed over. Someone holds him down as he tries to roll around, and a strong force pulls him up. Subaru yells out, It's because of them. That's their fault, not mine. He wanted to push it all to someone else and escape. Obart tells him to shut up, but Yorna calls out to wait, as something approaches with the sound of scraping. Fastening their arms behind Subaru's back, as he is tightly embraced, he resets. Explosions ring out, and shock dyed his vision bright red. Luis jumps onto his fallen body, and he repeated in his mind, Why? This isn't it. An eyeball burst, an eyeball popped out, his eardrums ruptured, crying out in pain, yet his head raced to think. This isn't mine. It's not. It's not. It's not. It was not Natsuki Subaru's return by death, but something else. He gets blown backwards again. He already knew this would happen. He was reliving the same ten seconds of despair that came time and time again. Pain. Red. Scary. Why? Death. This thought pattern repeated in his head. He was going mad. The explosion would pop his eyes and his eardrums, and there would be nothing but the red stain and ceaseless humming. The feeling of Luis jumping on him is all he would have left as death approaches. Subaru's body is again pushed by the explosion landing on the tile. 
Fearfully opening his eyes, he notes that he can see just fine this time. Albart then throws shuriken at the children, but Yorna intercepts them with her kisaru. He yells out to Yorna that Luis and him will be leaving, so do your best. Following his instructions, Luis teleports him down a floor, but before he can do anything, his head is cleaved off his shoulders. The feeling of having Luis be killed again, the feeling of having Yorna die trying to protect them, it all builds up. Why was he so worthless? Why do so many people hurt themselves to protect him? Why do they all... He finally manages to avoid the explosion and calls out the shuriken, and before Yorna can intercept them, he has Luis teleport them away. Even if it's just once, Albart was caught off guard. Letting Yorna deliver a fierce axe kick from directly above, his arm was crushed like a dead branch. He turns to face the children, and the moment he sees the ferociousness in his eyes, Subaru shouts to Luis, teleporting directly onto a bomb Albart had overthrown. In the Red World, the only feeling that dominated was pain. A feeling of helplessness that, regardless of how hard he tried, he could not reach the end. His mind felt like it was about to break. His heart felt like it was about to die. This was not returned by death. This was a loveless act. He escapes the explosion, gripping onto Luis. That, too, was already a conditioned reflex. He missed the warmth of people. That's all it was. A process he had witnessed countless times was unfolding before him. What if all paths, all action, led to death? What should I? How could it be avoided? The Red World, the Choir of Pain. Even if he wanted to help Yorna, he would be a burden. Even if he attempted to run, he would be caught. If only he had returned to an earlier point in time, he would have never gone to the roof with Yorna. If only he had left her alone. If only he had not parted with Abel, and if only he had not told them about the Weiss. Al, Medium, Tarita. If only he weren't smaller. If only he were Natsuki Subaru. Secure, Flop, Mazelda, Holly, Yutakata, Priscilla, Rem. He must bring her home, and yet, here he was, dying. It felt like it was going to crush his heart and body. And then, gently, the warmth of Luis holding his hand was transmitted, and he gulped. He realized, for Natsuki Subaru, it was impossible. But, if everyone else was here, what would they do? After so many repetitions of those ten seconds of despair, he arrived at what laid beyond. Once more, Subaru died over and over again. Many times, in repeated pain and suffering, he died. Not one of them worked. Subaru would always make Yorna sad, let Luis die first, then die as well. But there was a time that laid beyond the ten seconds of despair. He would utilize all of that time. If he used all of it and ended up dying, he would once again reach beyond the ten seconds, over to the eleventh second and think for dear life. All of his friends were so strong, his body was frozen, but Luis's hand still grabs hold. The hand that held onto him would not let him freeze to death, and because of that, he would remember everyone. I love all of you, so that's why. The one who wins. Luis jumps onto Subaru after the reset, and he thanks her. To murder Natsuki Subaru, Obart unleashed shurikens from his hands. Grabbing as tightly as he could onto his companion, he raises his hand to point directly at the vicious old man. If everyone else were here, what would they do? Regardless of how shameless, how unsightly the way he died was, in pain, with harshness, fear, crying, screaming, wetting himself, everyone placed faith in Subaru. He loves all of them. The one who always wins is you. He yells out to Luis, teleporting behind Albart, and clinging onto the back of his head. He caught him in this game of tag. It is Subaru's win. The 10 second loop was fantastic. I'll touch more on Return by Death being broken later, but the 10 second loop is an example of Subaru's growth, again, believe it or not, where he would normally, hopelessly, grope through the dark looking for a solution so that nobody would have to get hurt besides himself. He now thinks of the people that love him. The people that would give him a push to continue not to shoulder their burdens, but to secure his own life and happiness. Alongside Return by Death intrigue, something embracing him, the rawness of the loop, watching Subaru push through the horrid pain to get to the 11th second and thinking of what his loved ones would do, finding a path through the fog because he loves them, and having their words be forever etched into his heart is peak. He thinks back to his biggest loss, the failure that sticks with him, Shala, to find light in that darkness. Luis cries out alongside Subaru, clinging to his arm with a desperate look. Yorna says he can cry as much as he wants, and through the tears, Subaru asks Albart about infantilization. He says there might be a way to reset it, but he's never seen anyone do it. As Yorna inquires about Tanza, we cut to her with Vincent. It's not just Vincent, though, as Abel, Al, and Medium are in front of them. Abel apologizes for disturbing the Emperor's sleeping quarters. He simply wishes to speak with Tanza. The young girl then comes out, asking Abel to please not involve Yorna in this war. She is a kind woman who fights for the weak masses. Yorna will decide, he responds. Bowing your head will not make a difference. Tanza disagrees, though. It is his choice to make. Yorna responds to the love directed at her, so she would not refuse. Therefore, Tanza had to interfere. Abel has no intention of having Tanza killed, but he asks her to call the orders off. Even if Abel had not shown up, she would be engulfed in the maelstrom of war. It is unavoidable. He tells Tanza to raise her face. He did not call upon her mistress with the intention of wasting her. Her use requires thoughtful consideration. People should die in an efficient manner. It is my loss, the young girl says. 
That much is obvious, but there is no need to feel shame. Vincent then calls to her, reaffirming that she should not feel shame. You lost, but you threw the gauntlet, just as he had hoped. It is now safe to say that the attackers of Chaos Flame will stop. Abel's new goal is to find Olbart, and he suspects that he is atop the Crimson Lapis Castle. He informs Medium and Al that he has no intention of Olbart's technique being undone so simply, at least on Subaru. Al, furious and trembling with anger, shouts at Abel. It has nothing to do with wickedness, it is merely necessary. Al only has one arm, and Medium's eye and hair color are the reasons for her. They do not meet the requirements. The pieces are falling into place. You shall accompany me, Natsuki Subaru, ballooned by the unopposable wind into the midst of war. We cut back to Obart and Subaru as they talk about returning. That is when he remembers the issue he faced earlier with Return by Death. Found you, he hears. Everything that happened in that instant was incomprehensible for those who were not present. Obart's right hand from the wrist onwards vanished. Yorna grabbed onto Louise, jumping backwards. Pure dark flooded her field of vision as the castle tower got swallowed. Al begins to scream, louder than anyone in the city. No, louder than anyone in the world. Ubilk says that there are some bits he has not gazed. Abel looks towards the purple, shadowy mass erupting from the castle. Is this the true identity of the thing you had been carrying within, he asks, clenching his fist, biting his lip and drawing blood. I love you, over and over. A hellish world devoid of love, that he knew. That his own self was still loved, that Natsuki Subaru knew. However, at the same time, not all forms of love should be something to be affirmed. That he also should know. Exactly because of his ignorance, there would be retribution. Exactly because of his ignorance of why everyone dreaded it, ran from it. If he were to arrive at a world with love, what sort of hell would it be? If there was something he could say, in this situation inexplicable to anyone, there was only one thing. The utopia of those ostracized. The demon city of Chaos Flame. The ruin of this utopia was brought about by none other than Natsuki Subaru. There's a lot to talk about with regards to Phase 4 here. Uh, first of all, Return by Death is broken. I do believe my theory from before could come true that it is related to the love of Satella. Uh, this version of Subaru is not the one that saved her. When Subaru says his authority isn't his and Al is missing his power, I think we are led to believe that he is somehow using Al's authority. Especially because, like Al, this is the first time Subaru's deaths stop being numerical. But I think that's just a red herring. Al's authority requires conscious use, whereas Return by Death activates no matter what. Near the start of Arc 7, Luis placed her hand on Rem and helped her remember how to use healing magic. Now, in the 10 second loop, Luis puts her hand on Subaru and he begins to remember all of his loved ones despite them blanking earlier in the phase. Luis is capable of stimulating the memories of people in some way, possibly because she still maintains Rem's memories, and also possibly because she experienced life as Subaru Natsuki. I went into phase 4 hearing about how bad this phase is, uh, pretty much like every phase in Arc 7 so far, but this was good. Uh, it is my least favorite of the arc, but I mean, I still really enjoyed it. Subaru's regression of his ideology and him fighting his fighting force and others encouraging him. The 10 second loop is actually awesome. Al is Al. Abel is cool as fuck. And Yorna and Olbart are two super cool characters thus far. Yorna, of course, being more interesting to me. Ubilk and anything relating to the stars will always have me in a chokehold. It was slow in places. It could have used some heavy editing to trim the fat, much like previous phases, but it was great nonetheless. Now on to phase 5 or volume 30. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked this video, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe for the funny YouTube algorithm. You can check the description down below to follow me on Twitter, where I'm objectively correct all the time. Uh, you can also join my Discord, where we talk about My Hero Academia, Re Zero, Jujutsu Kaisen, and stuff like that. And you can also now become a YouTube member, which basically just gives you access to behind-the-scenes content, a little badge on comments and live stream chats, and access to some emotes. Only do so if you want to support the channel, though. But that's about it, though. Thank you for watching. See ya.